our presentation, and we've received uh, close to 50 or more or less questions, and they've been vetted uh, to, to avoid any duplications. And I've read the questions, and they're very, very good, specific questions and pertinent questions relative to flood rating, uh, risk rating 2.0 and how it may affect our citizens. So I'm going to ask uh, the representative of FEMA, and I just met him, uh, Mr. Gilbert Geron, Regional Flood Insurance Liaison, Region 6, Mitigation Division, Floodplain Management and Insurance Branch. Uh, Mr. Geron will be given a presentation and answering pre-submitted questions. I also want to acknowledge that we have staff uh, regarding uh, my administrative staff that are here that deal with floodplain issues, uh, building permits, and such that are, that are uh, certified in floodplain management as well, they're here. So on behalf of my administration, on behalf of the Parish Council, uh, I welcome you here. I welcome those who are viewing by way of Facebook Live or on our website or on our Ch Charter 710, Channel 710. Uh, we welcome you here and we welcome Mr. Duran. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate the introduction and the ability to come here and speak in front of the parish, uh, your administration, in front of all the citizens. Uh, my name is Gilbert Guidon. I'm the Regional Flood Insurance Liaison for FEMA at Region 6. I'm a direct employee for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. My position description, it requires me to interact between FEMA, are insured when we're talking about flood insurance and any issues they may have. Uh, so, for example, you may have your insurance through a provider, right? But there's an issue with your claim, issue with your premium. You feel you're not getting resolved through your provider. You would contact me, and I would come in, and I would try to address the issue until everyone has a satisfactory response. With that being said, part of my responsibility has been outreach and messaging in regards to risk rating 2.0. It is a major transformational leap forward from the way we were writing flood insurance. And one of the things is there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of confusion on what is risk rating 2.0. So today we're going to have about an hour on this presentation. I'm going to ask that questions be held to the end, and I'm going to address the written ones because I'm going to answer a lot of your questions. I have been doing this for about a year and a half, and the presentation works. Uh, I ask for you just to be patient with me, and, I, and at the end, when uh, we are wrapping up and I give you the resources, that if there are any additional questions, that we go through the administration to get those addressed. With that being said, I'm going to start with a few... Um, by the numbers of what is the NFIP, okay? The National Flood Insurance Program was, was created by Congress in 1968. It was first administered by HUD, and then later on transitioned over to FEMA where it is today, okay? So since 1968, the methodology in which to write flood insurance has left, been left largely untouched. 52, 54 years of using the same methodology to write flood insurance. It was time for a significant change, and that change is risk rating 2.0. But uh, a few things about it is we have 5 million policies in our book of business. Well, FEMA cannot write and maintain 5 million policies, so we have an agreement with what we call write your owns, WYOs. Those are the major insurance providers that you all go through. They are in contact, a contract with FEMA to not only write, but also administer flood insurance policies, and this is nationwide. Now, we do write a few direct policies on uh, behalf of customers who are in very high-risk zones or high-risk um, uh, variables because of their houses. But by far and large, our policies are going to be maintained by one of our WIO partners out there. With that, 5 million policies, we have about $1.3 trillion in total coverage out there nationwide. That is a lot of coverage provided by the federal government for a natural disaster. We have about 22,525 communities who participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, and this is important because flood insurance through the NFIP is not available unless your community is a participating member of the NFIP. That means the community has to submit an application, fill out a resolution, and have a ratified ordinance before they can join the NFIP. So the St. Tammany Parish has uh, been a participating member for years, and in fact, they have really stringent floodplain management regulations to adhere to, and that's going to be beneficial for homes down the road. 
So I want to jump right into the numbers with you, okay? This box right here is where we're going to see a lot of concern. Preferred risk policies. A preferred risk policy was one of our lowest cost product. It was a product that rolled up your building insurance and your content insurance into one policy. You had 250,000 building, 100,000 content rolled into one. And the average premium nationwide for a preferred risk policy was just shy of $500. Very reasonable, right? Very affordable. The problem with the preferred risk policy, the preferred risk policy was only allowed to be in areas outside of a special flood hazard area, right? An area we call an area of minimal flooding. You know it as zone X, okay? So our maps are focused on regulatory aspects of the special flood hazard area. Once we started getting outside of that, there were no regulations that apply. And we also did not have detailed information in zone X. We couldn't afford it. We can't afford to map entire communities, including zone X's. Okay, so that has turned around. And what we have found that full 33% of our claims have been in the areas of minimal flooding. We realized that we had to start taking the risks associated with these zone X's into consideration when we write flood insurance. Because of this, one of the main aspects of risk rating 2.0 is now going to incorporate the individual risk assessment of every structure in our book of business. So what that means is this preferred risk policy of the past was not based on the risks of the building. It was purely based on the location on a map. That is why the premiums were artificially low. We did not have any ways to associate risk with that. We do now using the algorithm on the calculator, which is the risk rating 2.0 engine. So with that being said, preferred risk policies are being removed. In fact, they ha have already been removed. You cannot buy a preferred risk policy anymore. The name will remain until all policies that have a preferred risk policy have been transitioned to risk rating 2.0 upon the renewal next year or this year. But because of that, as you see, it's a large percentage of our policy base. 49% of our single family homes across the nation are preferred risk policies. So this is of a concern to us because preferred risk policies are located outside of the special flood hazard area, which does not have the mandatory purchase requirements if the mortgage loans are touched by federal dollars in any way. But we have to take into consideration the amount of claims that we were paying into this area. Because of that, we made some other changes as well. If you take a look at the bottom box, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with what used to be called grandfathered policies, right? Grandfathered policies were uh, simply because a home was built before regulations were even a thing, before f uh, maps were even a thing, right? They built their houses way back when. It's not their fault. They were grandfathered in, and that has remained the same. But over the years, the grandfathering rates have increased year after year to a point where it's more advantageous to transition them over to a standard flood insurance policy. In fact, it has got to the point where nationwide we only have 165,000 grandfathered policies out of 5 million. So grand scale, not a whole lot. But one of the driving forces about risk rating 2.0 is not having any more subsidies. So grandfathering is also going away. It's still going to be beneficial because the last rate you had under the legacy system is going to be your starting point under risk rating 2.0. And we'll talk more about the rating structure and the glide path here in a few minutes on the slides. What I would like to bring your attention to are the pre-firm subsidies and the newly mapped properties. So risk rating 2.0, it was, as I mentioned, a, a transformational leap forward, okay? Uh, we have asked for Congress to make changes in the National Flood Insurance Program for years. And for years, we have not had any movement. We had to act. So we acted within our own scope of authority that was provided to us under the charter of the National Flood Act of 1968 to make changes. In fact, that charter requires that we have a financially sound program. So we made changes to every aspect that we could. There were some aspects we could not make changes to because they are statutory requirements or they were enacted by Congress. And that is pre-firm subsidies and newly mapped properties. 
Okay, so those two are statutory programs and they are remaining in place. If you are eligible for that, your agents, your, your individual insurance agents will be the ones to determine your eligibility when you fill out your applications. The way these discounts are applied are going to be a little bit different. It's going to be up to 35% off the first 30,000 of coverage, something very similar to the way it was under the legacy system. And then every uh, after that, the remaining coverage will be based off of the uh, standard uh, flood insurance uh, my policy premiums based on risk rating 2.0. What I'd like to bring your attention to next is high risk coastal zones. I know we're a little bit further away from the coast, but as you'll take a look, there's only 12,289 of what we call V zones nationwide. Grand scale, not a lot. But as you can imagine, if you built a property in a coastal area, the regulations you had to be uh, built to are pretty stringent, right? Not only do you have to build higher, but you have to build more resilient. You have to, if you build high enough, you have to start taking wind in consideration, right? So they're more robust, they're more, more uh, stout structures. They're going to be more impervious to the peril of flooding than structures inland that are built slab on grade foundations. So this one right here, full risk property, in my opinion, are going to be some of the best suited because we have known variables. So the preferred risk policies, newly mapped, pre-firm, we base a lot of that on assumptions. The full risk property are often post construction. That means we know what their risk is because they followed the regulations the administration has put into place, such as requirements for elevation certificates, requirements for freeboard one, two, three feet above the basewood elevations. So we know what those risks are, so they're gonna be better suited under risk rating 2.0 because they already have the uh, requirements of what their full risk is gonna be. So, these are some of the numbers of how the, uh, we had under the legacy system of the National Flood Insurance Program. So as you can imagine, with the preferred risk policies going away, we're seeing some changes. Everyone calls risk rating 2.0 risk rating 2.0. The actual name is risk rating 2.0 equity in action. And uh, we get asked a lot if uh, we're causing increases across the board, how could it be called equity in action? Well, we're seeing increases in areas of higher risk of flooding. And a lot of the areas where we don't have as much water inland, we're seeing substantial decreases. But we are still addressing this as equity in action because for years, oh, I didn't put in the right slide. For years, we inadvertently created a system where lower valued homes have been subsidizing the repair of higher valued homes. And let me put this in context for you. This young lady has a home valued at two hundred thousand dollars this gentleman has a home valued at two million dollars all the characteristics of their flood risks are the same under the old system they're both one foot above the bfe they are both in an ae flood zone under the old system their flood insurance premiums would have been the same although one inch of water is going to cost drastically more damage in a two million dollar home than a $200,000 home. So in essence, they're subsidizing the repair of the higher valued homes. Risk rating 2.0, we are fixing this. We are going to associate replacement cost value as a direct variable to determine your flood insurance premium. Lower valued homes are gonna have a lower flood insurance premium. Higher valued homes are gonna have a higher flood insurance premium. Now I get asked this all the time. So if we're going to go off replacement cost value, and this home is valued at $2 million, what's the point when you only have a cap of $250,000 in coverage? Well, the answer is, to that is because of the partial claims for these higher valued homes often exceed the statutory caps, but don't exceed the damaged, damaged threshold that require mitigation for these structures. So even though the cap is $250,000, this higher valued home is going to often reach that a lot faster and more often than the lower valued homes. So risk rating 2.0 equity in action, we have fixed this. We have addressed the inequity of lower valued homes, subsidizing the repair of higher valued homes. So why does this not stop on the flood line? We had a rating cliff. Um, anyone here live actually in a special flood hazard area? Yeah, okay. So in your house, you are inside of a regulatory special flood hazard area. And let's just say across the street from you, right, the flood map ends right in the middle of the street. And that house right across the street from you is a zone X. 
there is a drastic difference in flood insurance costs simply because he is inside of a special flood hazard area and the house right across the street is not. But in reality, is that line in the middle of the street going to stop the flow of water? No, water is going to go where water wants to go. But simply because that boundary line, that, that line on that map says so, he has a policy that's you know $1,500, $2,000 less than his neighbors across the street. That's what the rate cliff we are addressing. Under risk rating 2.0, we are not going to be using flood zones and we are not going to be using base flood elevations to determine your flood insurance premiums. I'm going to go into detail on the variables that we will be using and it will take a while for this to kind of you know, settle in and kind of understand the process. I was in compliance for several years before this and one of the first things we did when we had a case to review was ask what flood zone is it going to be in, what is the lowest floor and what is the BFE? And then we start research from there. So it took a while, but once you start understanding the context of what is the variables, the new variables, you have a better understanding of how it applies. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the NFIP was created in 1968 by Congress, right? It was created to be a standalone program, meaning that we collected the premiums, and then when a claim happened, we used those premiums to pay the claims. And everything worked well. It was working really well until one year. Anyone want to take a guess of what year? 2005. 2005 is a year that we just can't get rid of. We paid over $17.5 billion that year. But that's okay. That's okay because we were designed to collect in premiums. But what happened after that? We started getting hit with more events, a greater frequency, but not only that, greater severity, right? These storms were hitting faster, they were hitting longer, and they were hitting harder. For the past six years, we have paid out over $1.2 billion in claims every year. And the old program could not maintain this. It was not sustainable. We had to have major changes. And risk rating 2.0 is a way to do this. We wanted to bring everyone up to their actuarial risk, often called full risk, and we can maintain a sound financial program because that is the charter of our program. We have to have a financially sound NFIP program. So I have this up here for a minute. This is the legacy methodology. This was the old system of how we determine flood insurance costs. What I would like to bring your attention to are the variables, or the lack of variables that are there. Under the old system, we used the flood insurance rate map zone to determine your flood insurance premium. We used base flood elevation, foundation type, and if you were inside of the special flood hazard area, we used structural elevation. We also only used one of two flood perils to go off of your flood risk. You're either based off of riverine, right? Um, flu uh, uh, riverine flooding, or you're based off coastal storm surge flooding, but only one of the two. Do I have any engineers in here? Could a structure be impacted by more than one peril? Yet, we were only going off of one of two. Well, our actuaries worked with our scientists, right, and they determined that there's actually six flood perils. So we created new variables to determine flood insurance premiums. And under risk rating 2.0, this is what this looks like. We're going to break this down here in a minute in a couple more slides, but distance to flooding source and type. Okay, The flooding source and type is the six flood perils I want to be talking about in the next slide. But distance to flooding source, and we're talking significant flooding source here. We're talking about major rivers, we're talking great lakes, we're talking coasts, right? Now one of the things I still haven't got an answer back from headquarters are your bayous. Because you guys have some bayous that are the size of a swimming pool and you got some bayous that straddle three or four different parishes. They're unique in nature, right? So the, the thing to remember, it has to be a significant flooding source. We're not talking about a small canal, canal in the back, a dry, a dry tributary. We're talking about a significant flooding source. Building occupancy has always been a big issue for us, big concern for us, because you have a federal agency that is ensuring a structure from a natural disaster. We want your primary residence to be protected. Although we will ensure your second, third homes, your rental properties, our concern is you have a place to live. So the building occupancy is going to have a big impact on your glide path. Uh, the glide path is 18%, and we'll talk more about in the definition of what is the glide path when we get to the actual rating. 
The construction type, and we should put in construction method as well, are now taken in consideration under risk rating 2.0. What we mean by this is for years, wood has been the go-to construction method, right? Wood frame, um, slab on grade with wood frame, right? Follow maybe some brick veneer. Well, what handles flooding better, masonry product or wood? Masonry product, right? We are now gonna start offering construction discounts, right? Not only for uh, masonry products, but for foundation types. Pier, beam, crawl space, elevated structures are gonna have a lower flood insurance premium than slab on grade foundations. Even if those slab on grade foundations are put on top of fill. Right, fill is an approved method. Uh, we, we allow it under 44 CFR to bring in fill, but that fill makes water go different directions. Adverse impact, maybe on your neighbors, maybe other buildings down the street, right? The most sure way to have a less impact, adverse impact, is elevating your structures, pure piles on post, even crawl space that are properly vented. So now that we're gonna offer discounts for those. The foundation type. Now, I'm not sure if any of you had to deal with an elevation certificate before, but there's 80 different diagrams on some of our ECs. It's ridiculous, right? Risk rating 2.0 is not only designed to implement full risk rate, but we're also trying to remove a lot of the complexity of what was the old system. So we are transitioning to a foundation type of six foundations only. Every construction method out there will be whittled down to one of these six. Now, if you want more details on that, it's gonna be found in the flood insurance manual that's dated after October. Uh, 2021, that reflects all risk rating 2.0 changes. It has to be the one after. There's going to be one in there before that won't have what you need, right? Um, ground elevation. Ground elevation has always been really important under the old system, but now we're not looking just at the ground elevation of the footprint of the house. We're looking at the ground and surrounding elevation. So if you have relative elevations that's beneficial for you, we're going to capture that, and we're going to capture that automatically based off our new risk rating engine. It's not something that has to be reviewed by your agent or an, um, a surveyor. It's something that we happen, that we, we created a product just to do that, right? Uh, first floor height. The old elevation certificates, right? Uh, you, if they were filled out correctly, which you know, surveyors try really hard to do a good job, but sometimes mistakes happen. They go off of the firm instead of the flood insurance study. They don't do the tenth of foot accuracy or they don't get the, the correct lag or correct uh, hag, right? It can be confusing. Well, the first floor height. Remember how I told you earlier we are not going to be going off of flood zones and BFEs anymore? We are going to be going off of your first floor height. And that is very simple. All we are asking is how high is your first living floor from the ground? That's it. No more complicated formula, no more determining the tenth of foot accuracy off the FIS, right? Just how high is your first living floor from the ground? Specifically the lowest chase and grade, and I do have diagrams that will break into that. Uh, number of floors. Number of floors are a big impact. If you have multiple floors, the, the uh, likelihood of the second story and higher being impacted by the flood peril are negligible. They start to reduce, right? During a flooding event, what floor is most likely to be impacted by a flooding event? The first floor, thank you, sir. The first floor. So we want that first floor to be as protected as possible. All the other floors are actually probably gonna reduce your flood insurance premium because they're less likely to experience damage. So now imagine we go back to the construction method. If we protect that first floor with masonry product, we elevate on pure piles on posts, first floor masonry. Second one, second floor can be built out of straw. Doesn't matter because that first floor is protected. That's gonna get you really good insurance premiums. Prior claims. I have a whole bunch of slides on prior claims, but like any other insurance product, prior claims will continue along the path. Under risk rating 2.0, however, we are implementing a couple of changes. There was no way for our actuaries to determine a way to bring over the prior claims at one time. So what we have decided to do is start everyone with a clean slate. That doesn't mean they're being erased or deleted. It just means that your variable under risk rating 2.0 when you roll over during your transition period will have a variable of zero. Until your first claim under risk rating 2.0 then it will come into play. This way our actuaries are able to do it one at a time. 
We can break it down. It will be easier for them to maintain this. But we're also implementing another procedure. We have determined that there are a lot of old claims out there, right? Claims from, you know, 40, uh, 30, 40, 45 years ago, right? Is the ground truth when that claim happened even somewhat accurate today? Chances are it's not. So why are we holding those claims against you? So we're implementing a 20-year rolling window. At the end of that 20 years, when a claim happens, it's going to fall off. So what happened? In, what storm hit in 2005? Katrina? So we're just a couple years from that storm falling off. So we'll be able to dissect that here in a few minutes. Now, one of the things I like to talk about, well, I'm sorry, one of the things I don't like to talk about, but I have to bring up, is that premiums will increase under risk rating 2.0 up to 18% until you hit full risk rate, okay? Those premiums are capped by Congress. But a lot of times people look at their annual pay amount and they notice that that amount appears to be higher than 18%. That's because fees and surcharges, okay? If you were to break this down, look at your declaration page and just look at the premium portion of your declaration page, you will see that that increase is not over 18%. But when you add on the fees and surcharges, which we will also talk about here, it can easily look like it is. But I just wanted to go over that and I'll break those fees and surcharges down to you when we get to the mock declaration page. Okay, so this is new pricing methodology or the flood perils that are going to be added on to the rating methodology. Remember, under the old system, the legacy system, you were being rated off of one of two flood perils, riverine or coastal storm, one of those. However, under risk rating 2.0, if you are in the right location, or I should say the wrong location, all six of these flood perils can be added on. So you are already familiar with the coastal storm and um, this one right here, inland flood, a riverine. Those are the one of the two. So we have added on a couple more. We have added on tsunami, which is a great risk off the coast. So the fact that we're further inland made that that peril may not be added on. A coastal erosion, once again, may not add on. But this one right here, inland flood fluvial. This is taken into consideration after Hurricane Harvey in Texas in 2017. 52 inches of rain fell in one area. Totally inundated entire cities. Unprecedented amount of rain. But because of that rainfall, we asked some federal agencies to look into historic rain events. We asked NOAA. And what NOAA found was that their, uh, their uh, predictions of rainfall were inaccurate. So they came out with a new study. It's called NOAA Atlas 14 with new predictions of rainfall. And the, rain, the new predictions were mind-blowing. Rainfall is a significant event, and we have to take that in consideration, and we have with inland flood fluvial. This is going to impact low-lying areas, and most low-lying areas are often on the other sides of levees, right? So you may be protected by levee, but there's still flood perils that could impact you. So we just talked about these six. And speaking of levies, uh, levies will still offer a discount. And I'm, I'm jumping ahead, ahead here. Levies will still offer a discount, okay? But a lot of people around these areas where these flood perils are going to apply are seeing an increase. And this increase is making them think that the discounts they received before are no longer valid, such as protected by levy, such as their elevation. But it is. In fact, if the levy wasn't there or they didn't elevate when they did, their premium would be even higher. What they're seeing is an increase of their flood perils. Especially in areas where we used to have preferred risk policies. Remember, they were never based off the risk. They were based on the location on a map. So now we have the capability to map every individual structure in our book of business and assign a risk, a flood risk, to that building. And we're seeing that a lot of these structures that were in the PRP that had those policies of five, six hundreds were not where they needed to be risk-wise. Some are seeing increases up to $2,000. Some are seeing decreases. My preferred risk policy was canceled. My preferred risk policy went from $600 to 450 But I am not even close to water. I'm in North Texas. 
So there are seen increases in areas that warranted these flood perils and decreases in areas where these flood perils are not even a concern. So let's talk about what is changing in the new pricing mythology. The flood insurance rate maps are something that have been used for years, right? The name dictates what the purpose was, flood insurance rate maps. They were used to determine how much we charge for flood insurance. But now that we are transitioning away from them, flood insurance rate maps are still important because we have to keep track of mandatory purchase requirements, right? Mandatory purchase requirements is a, a mortgage or a loan that is touched by federal dollars. So Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, VA HUD, or an SBA loan is used on a structure if it's inside of a special flood hazard area, has to maintain flood insurance. The amount of coverage is going to be dictated by the lender. Most of the time, it's the value of the home or the amount of the loan. Okay, So that's still going to be in place. They won't be used for rating variables, but still going to be used for that purpose and also still be used for compliance purposes. So even though what we're talking about today is insurance-specific changes, the administration, their flood administrators, floodplain administrators will still be using the firm and FIS to administer their floodplain to remain in good, in good standing of the National Flood Insurance Program. So we're using new risk considerations to better quantify the real risk of a structure. We have integrated data sets from um, not just FEMA and also not just other federal agencies from also third party or private sectors, right? I'll be perfectly honest with you. The private sector flood insurance has been using these models for years. Remember I mentioned that we are 54 years without a major change in how we wrote flood insurance. You know, that, that's ridiculous. My personal opinion, we should have done, you know, every 10, 12 year increments of changes, right? But and that's one of the things I should have started this presentation off is remember that I am not a decision maker. Um, I had nothing to do with implementing these policies. I've just been trained on how to uh, teach on it. <laughs> um, so we've incorporated um, a large scale of the events and we've also incorporated broader range of frequency, right? We've actually went up to 10,000 years, right, of historical data my engineers didn't catch that. We don't have 10,000 years of written history, right? How can we have 10,000 year records? We base this off of simulations. We use the Monte Carlo method, and we have simulated 10,000 years of, of the worst case scenarios to help us understand the true risk assigned to structures, to areas, right? So we incorporated the catastrophic modeling. They're really the backbone of our engine and how we are going to determine the flood insurance costs. We have incorporated urban flooding as well. I, I like to pick on Houston a lot because I just don't understand that city. They, half that city is wetlands and bayous, and they keep building to the east where there's more wetlands and bayous. Build to the west. But they keep building that direction, and that's creating more urban flooding because you can put all the cement down you want, but the water still has to go someplace. Cost to rebuild. Okay. So we already talked about the inequity that we accidentally built into the old system and how we're going to correct that. Well, the replacement cost value is a big determining factor. A lot of people don't realize this, but under the old system, only a select few structures were actually insured to replacement cost value. You had to be insured to over 80% of the value of your structure, or some residential condominium association buildings were automatically um, built, insured to replacement cost value with the help of some co-insurance, right? For most others, we took actual cash value into consideration. Now, with actual cash value in, into consideration, we also have to take something else into consideration. Would anyone like to hazard a guess? Place. Place. Depreciation. So think of it like this. We got really nice chairs right here, right? Brand new, I guarantee you, these chairs are probably about $100 a piece. So in about 10 years, after constant use, you know, the administration is going to get $25 on Facebook Marketplace. That is depreciation. If a home is not maintained, if the roofs are not maintained, if the structures that are damaged by flood are not maintained, that depreciation is subtracted off the flood insurance claim. That's not going to be the case anymore with Risk Rating 2.0. Risk Rating 2.0 will be based solely on replacement cost value, and that's already industry-wide, private sector-wide. We're just now catching up. So one other thing that risk grading, risk grading 2.0 is trying to do. So the rating variables. 
We are trying to standardize the rating variables we have. I don't know if any of you have ever read the old flood insurance manual. Uh, and there's a new one too. And if you ever have any trouble sleeping, I guarantee you'll be asleep before you finish the first paragraph. It's taken me three years to get through one. But the flood insurance manual in the back used to have a series of rating schedules. Now these rating schedules were meant for people to look up and see if they're being charged the right premiums, but the problem was they were so confusing. Because you had to have the right one, you had to find the original construction date. Then you had to worry if the schedule you're looking at was pre or post 1978, 1981. Then you had to make sure that it's in the correct flow zone. What if it's in a D or C or an E, which are not being used anymore? Chances are people didn't find the right schedules and caught confusion, right? Well, we did away with that. We did away with that, okay? Those rating schedules are no longer available. In fact, right now, since risk rating 2.0 is relatively new, the only way to get a quote is going through your licensed property and casualty insurance agent, okay? I ask you not to get one, but get two quotes. So the question I get asked a lot is, shouldn't the information be the same? And the answer is yes. Doesn't matter what agent this young lady goes to, or this gentleman goes through. If they give the identical information, the quote should be the same, but the problem is they're not, right? What you are looking for is you're not price matching. You are interviewing agents for knowledge and experience because if they are well-versed on how to write flood uh, risk rating 2.0 policy, they're gonna be well-versed and experienced in helping you file your claim. But if they can't write or they can't give you a quote under risk rating 2.0 without having to have a lot of questions from other people, those are the same ones that you're going to submit your claim to if it happens. So just keep that in mind. So we already talked about this, the rating variables, a legacy method versus the new price methodology. Uh, we talked about the new perils, right? And they both are determined automatically using the GIS data or the geolocation tool that we're going to talk about here. The rating uh, building occupancy, so single family dwelling, single family home, manufactured home, residential unit, as long as it's your primary residence, right? So risk rating 2.0 uh, is gonna be something like this. If you have an existing flood insurance policy, okay, the last policy that you paid is gonna be your starting point under risk rating 2.0. And when you get your first declaration page under risk rating 2.0, we are finally gonna tell you what is your true risk rate. If your true risk rate is already higher than your annual pay amount, you are going to receive a disc, you're going to receive an immediate decrease. Now, if your annual pay amount is under your full risk rate, you will experience an 18% glide path every year until you hit your full risk rate. Once you hit your full risk rate, those increases will stop. Now, why do we hit 18%? How, why do we have that? Well, Congress passed the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act in 2014. To that, that act required that Congress required us to increase flood insurance premiums every year, no less than 5%, but no more than 18%. So it's a congressional, it's a statutory requirement. So since we did not make any changes that requires Congress's approval or permission, we stayed with 18%. So that is why we have the 18% glide path. But you will experience that glide path until you hit full risk rate. And this is the first year we have ever provided first risk rates. The old system, the HAFIA, it, it, it has always caught me off guard because it says you will increase flood insurance premiums annually until they hit full risk rate, but they never identified what is the full risk rate. So in essence, those increases would have been forever. We corrected that with risk rating 2.0. We now know, you will know what your full risk rate is. It's gonna be on your declaration page when you transition over to risk rating 2.0. So with that, the billion occupancy is why we are talking about the 18% because we want your primary home to be protected. So your primary residence will have that cap of 18%. But if it's your fishing camp, if your second, third, or all your rental home, those are going to be capped at 25% to get you to your full risk rating. We want you at your full risk rating, and I'll tell you why when we get to the CRS program, okay? Uh, the community rating system. Um, so we're gonna break it down a little bit more construction type of method. Here we have an example of masonry product being used to elevate a structure. So this structure illustrates two possible discounts, right? One, just because it's gonna be elevated. 
Pierce piles on post are going to get a lower flood insurance premium than slab on grade. Another discount is because we are using masonry product for the elevation. Now, if they were to use masonry product instead of wood, that would be three avenues for reduced premium. But this is still a good start, right? This is still a really good start to help reduce the burden of flood insurance. It's also a very resilient method. Um, one of the questions that we had was about the definition of a flood. Uh, a flood is uh, inundated by two or more acres or two or more houses or properties, one of which is the flood insurance um, owners. So if the insured owns that house and it impacts two houses, so it's not a big geographical location, uh, location that has to be impacted to meet our definition of a flood. Just two or more structures in a day with water or two or more acres in a day with water, and that's our definition of a flood. So we are taking this in consideration for the first time. You know, overall, these discounts I'm talking about may not be significant in nature, but we are now capturing this information, okay? We now know what structures are going to be more resilient, and we can keep track of them. We'll have detailed information later on to see how well masonry product held up to wood or wood frame construction, and therefore we can continue with maybe more discounts with masonry type products. So under the old system, we had up to 80 different diagrams when we talked about the elevation certificate. We are going to whittle those 80 different diagrams to six simple foundations. And those foundations are as follows, slab on grade. Okay, I know we have a lot of slab on grade structures in our existing inventory. I understand this. Risk grading 2.0 can help some of them. Risk grading 2.0 is going to be of a more benefit to new construction when we capture the other types of foundation types. We're talking about basement and crawl spaces for the first set of three foundation types, followed closely by elevated without enclosure on post pile and pier, elevated, uh, elevated without enclosure, then elevated with enclosure and post pile and pier, or elevated with enclosure, not post pile and pier. So I know hanging floors are really popular. That's going to be to determine as an elevated without enclosures, but every construction method out there will be whittled down to one of these six. As I said, the flood insurance manual will help go into detail to determine what foundation type is to be used for that rating purpose. The geolocation tool. How this works is when you sit down with your agent, you, give your, you fill out an application. One of the first things you fill out is your home address. That address is going to be trans, the application is going to be transmitted to FEMA where they're going to run it on the risk rating engine. And that risk rating engine is going to convert that address to latitude and longitude. And then that's going to be ping off of our data sets. We're going to ping it off of the data sets to determine the distance to flooding source, if any of apply. If they don't, it moves on. And if it does, then it identifies which one will be added on to the variables. Then it'll move to the ground and surrounding elevation. This is really important, especially in areas where, where homeowners have done their due diligence and built their homes in higher areas. We're gonna capture the ground and surrounding elevation, even the relative elevations, well, I'll show you an example of that. We're gonna ask, is it protected by levy? And if it is, what level of protection? Under the old system, levies had to be certified by the Army Corps of Engineers, right, to allow any type of a discount under flood insurance, right? So how many levies out there are not accredited, are not certified, but offer some protection? A lot, a lot. There's several hundred in the state of Louisiana that are not certified, <coughs> excuse me. Under risk rating 2.0, we are not requiring a certification under the Army Corps of Engineers to offer a reduced flood insurance premium. We are requiring that they do offer some protection and that they are in the Army Corps of Engineers levy data set. So we are not going to require that these levies maintain their certification. Now they still have to for compliance. Uh, if they want grant money, they still have to meet all those other criteria. But for flood insurance, they don't have to be certified levies but they still have to prove to offer a level of protection. And that level of protection is going to determine how much of a discount. So if you have areas that have really well built up levees with really good maintenance plans and plumbing stations, the discount is going to be greater than if you have a reduced levy that's not maintained but still offers some coverage. It's going to lower that type of a discount. 
but it's still going to be discounts nonetheless. It's also going to ask if you're in a watershed. If you are, if you're upstream, if you're downstream, we're going to ask if you're located in a barrier island or if you're in a cobra zone, um, coastal barrier uh, resource area that are protected uh, natural uh, wetlands and, and wildlife refuges. All that's going to be answered automatically on the engine. So the first floor height, remember how I told you we're no longer going to be using base foot elevations to determine your variables? Instead, we're going to transition to a very simple method. It's called first floor height. We're asking the question, how high is the first floor from the ground? In particular, what is known as the lowest adjacent grade. If you were to walk around your house, right, I guarantee you, you would find one part of your foundation that is lower than all the rest. That is the leg. That's what we're asking. How high is your first floor from the ground? And since we have transitioned away from the old method of elevation certificates and BFEs and, you know, tenth of a foot accuracy and the FIS and the firm, we're going to provide this information for a large number of policies under our book of business. We fully expect that we can provide the first floor height to up to 80% of our book of business. Okay? So there's going to be three methods in which we determine the first floor height. One is our first floor height tool. This is a proprietary product that was built for us using GIS and other engineering data to try to capture the first floor height for every structure in the United States. Proprietary product, right? At first, I thought it was not going to be achievable. Boy, did they prove me wrong. They have, and we have found a level of accuracy that is, is really good, really astounding, actually. Okay, so we have other avenues. This is going to be the first option, but if we don't, we're going to have the second option, which is FEMA assumptions. Now, FEMA assumptions are to be used when there's no other data available for a structure. But that's impossible, right? Because you have architect plans, you have design drawings, you have permits from the community. You will always have other methods because the assumptions are capped at two feet. They will not go higher than two feet. So if you have drawings and drawings call for your first floor to be nine foot, assumptions are only going to give you two foot benefit. Assumptions for when we have no other data to go off of at all. The third method is going to be elevation certificates. Well, I just told you we won't need an elevation certificate to purchase flood insurance, right? And you won't. But here's the deal about an elevation certificate, okay? Elevation certificate is a great document for every homeowner to have. It has really good information on there. Yes, we used to use it for flood insurance because it offered a flood zone. It would identify the BFE and the lowest floor determined flood insurance cost, right? But it has so much more information. It has the correct panel, the correct suffix, the effective date of the map. It has the lowest station grade, the highest station grade. It has location of your machinery and equipment. It has detailed notes from the surveyor. It has colored photographs, right? So still a great document for homeowners to have. Plus, you can still use it to check our information, right? Because the government never makes mistakes, right? Trust but verify. We say that, sir, we're going to give you the first floor height. Use your EC to check our data. Because if your EC comes back and your numbers are better, we're going to take your elevation certificate and we're going to give you the most advantageous rate based off that EC instead of our first floor height. So trust but verify. So those are the three methods in which we are going to use to determine the first floor height. Very simple question. We're asking nowadays is how high is the first floor from the ground? Number of floors. So this is important. Number of floors will no longer include basements, enclosures, and crawl space. If you were ever having trouble sleeping and you've already tried reading the flood insurance manual, uh, 44 Code of Federal Regulations 59.1 is a series of definitions. And in that definitions is basements. Basement under that criteria is defined as below grade surrounded on all four sides. There's some 60s architecture that has the sunken living rooms that meet the definition of basements. So that means even though their first floor is relatively high, they have that sunken living room, so we have to go off of the basement for the lowest floor under the old system. Under risk rating 2.0, we don't. We won't count basements and closures or crawl spaces as the lowest floors. Those are going to be captured in the foundation types. Remember the second foundation types is basement, the third was sub, uh, crawl space. That is where we're going to capture those risks. So the number of floors are going to be number of floors above ground. 
We are also doing away with the confusing method of determining uh, the floors in relation to how the flood insurance policy is written. Uh, it was confusing when you had high-rises, condominium association type buildings. It wasn't one for one. It was some weird formula, but now it is. Single family homes, three plus are gonna be three plus. Residential condominiums, 100 plus, 100 plus. Once again, we're trying to remove the complexity of what was the old system. Okay, prior claims. So I already told you that we are starting off with a clean slate. Okay, now there are some exceptions to this. Those who have been deemed severe repetitive loss. Okay, now severe, se severe repetitive loss means the structure has experienced over four claims over $5,000 or two claims that have exceeded the value of the home, right? So they are going to start with the clean slate as well, but they're going to have an additional surcharge added on. Now, when their first claim under risk rating 2.0 hits, that surcharge will fall off. However, every claim that was tied to that severe repetitive loss house will come back at once. So four or five claims, that would have a significant impact on the flood insurance costs. Okay, so all others, we're starting off with a clean slate. Not deleting, not erasing, just variables are going to be zero at first, right? So one of the things I like to mention first is we have what's called excluded losses. So anyone here ever heard of increased cost of compliance? Great. Increased cost of compliance is written into everyone's policy. You actually pay a small fee every year. What it is, is if your structure is ever damaged, you're inside of the special flood hazard area and you're damaged to more than 50%, you are now considered a substantial damage structure. And your structure has to be brought into full compliance. That means ICC can be used. It's an additional fund up to $30,000 to help your structure come to compliance. Okay? So that is not considered a loss under our eyes. And also claims, uh, claims closed without payment. So closed without payment can happen in a couple ways. First, uh, the amount of damage simply didn't exceed the amount of the deductible, so they decided not to pursue or a homeowner is evacuating, uh, they're sure that their house is going to get demolished, so they initiate a claim while they're evacuating. Uh, just to get home you know, a week or two later and found out the storm did a, a U-turn around them um, and their house was spared, so it's closed without payment as well. Those are excluded claims. Before all others, they will be maintained. Now, we are doing a 20-year rolling period. So as you can see from this diagram, we have a policy purchased in 2003. We have first claim in 2007. We have a second in 2011. So 2021, October of 2021 was when phase one went into effect for risk rating 2.0. So from then on, this is all risk rating 2.0. So 2021, the variable for any claims would have been zero. So 2024 is their first claim under risk rating 2.0, but it's their third claim, okay? So you look here, number of claims three, prior claims factors three minus one. We get that minus one because your first claim under NFIP is forgiven. So that's why we have the minus one. So right here, the factor would have been two. Now here, we have finally got from 2007 to 2027, we finally got to that 20 year period, right? So now the factor is two minus one, which is one, because the 20 year old claim from 2007 falls off. This never happened before under the old system. And as you can see, when you rebuild after these events, and if you rebuild with resiliency and mitigation in mind, the old claims are going to fall off. Hopefully, it won't have any new claims because of the elevation mitigation projects you've been able to incorporate into your design uh, construction. So this is really exciting for us. Um, I'm happy that we're removing. I have had people call me before uh, because the claims stay with the house. As much as uh, this gentleman looks like a really nice guy, I track his house. When he sells his house in three years, he's moving to Florida, I'm saying goodbye. I'm saying, how's your house doing? Because we track the house. So if the house has changed hand multiple times, it doesn't matter. We track the number of claims that stay with the house. So I have people call me, unfortunately, they're not told the truth at closing or disclosure, and they actually had, they aware of one claim, but they were not aware from the three prior claims from the four different owners before that. So we track all of that. And this is good for them because a lot of the older claims are which cause that confusion because when they fill out the disclosures, they're asked, are you aware of? 
and sometimes they're not aware of the original claims that happened early on. Okay, so FEMA is providing values for geographic variables. You're providing first floor height, replacement cost value, and NFIP claim history, right? What can your homeowners provide? Well, you can provide grad elevation. Yeah, if you have a ground survey that's stamped and sealed by a PE architect or some professional field that shows different numbers, send it in. Well, just send it in. We'll determine if that provides different numbers. Once again, if the ground elevations show a more advantageous rate, we will accept that information. The first floor height, as I mentioned, elevation certificate is a way to verify our data. If you have that information, provide it to your agent. Have them do a quote. Here's the thing about that. A quote is not sent to headquarters for processing until it's ready to transition to a policy, right? If it's a quote and you decide that or the elevation certificate shows that it's not beneficial, all you got to do is remove that and then carry on. We'll never know. Um, the replacement cost value. We will provide that based off our calculator, but if you have other means, some type of professional appraisal or another way to determine a professional replacement cost value, submit that. And NFIP claims history, how can that be on both? Right? Well, I can tell you now the federal government never makes any mistakes. We never tie claims to the wrong house. I'm just kidding. We do. It's on accident, but imagine the growth out there, right? A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of developers are not getting creative with names. They're just adding on circle, core, or something with the same street name and street, street numbers. So we have accidentally tied claims to the wrong houses in the past. And I'm sure there are a number of them out there. So that's when you get my card from the top. You call me and say, hey, um, I know for a fact we didn't have a claim here, and we will work that out. So those are, the, those are things that can be submitted by the homeowner to help verify that. So fees and surcharges, I talked about that a few minutes ago. We have the reserve fund assessment fee. Now, if I had the capability of doing one change in the NFIP, I would wave a wand and remove that fee. It is an 18% fee of the overall premium that is used to create a pool to help pay claims. Pay claims. But I have seen that fee in some locations add on to up to $1,000 of fees and surcharges on top of her premiums. Uh, the Hafaya surcharge was enacted by Congress. The, the Hafaya surcharge is $25 for your primary residence, $250 for all other residents. Federal policy fee, I did get a discount for you there. I went from $50 to $47 for you, so I saved you $3. Probation surcharge, we have no issues with St. Tammany Parish. They are a model when it comes to their cooperation and uh, participation in the NFIP, but there are some communities across the country who are not so willing to enforce the regulations. And if that ever happens, they will be put on probation, which adds on a $50 surcharge to every policy in the jurisdictional boundaries of that community until it is corrected. And if not, then we move to suspension, which means all policies will lapse at renewal, and that's not good for anyone. This is an example of a mock declaration page of what you should be seeing under Risk Rating 2.0. Now remember, I have over 60 different companies who administer our policies, and they each have their own version of a declaration page. But it should be something very familiar or similar to this. What you are going to see are your premiums, right? Under the old system, uh, some products, such as the preferred risk policy, tied your building and your content into one. That is not the case anymore. You will have to get building and content separately. Those are going to be identified. So as I mentioned, the increased cost of compliance is going to be there. In this example, it's a $10 fee. Then a mitigation discount is applied there. As you can see, it's $100. So a mitigation discount is going to be the construction method or type. Remember I mentioned masonry products or some type of elevation? It's captured at $100. So the full risk premium is what is new. We never identified the full risk premium before. But as you can see here, it's $1,200. Okay. So under full risk uh, for uh, statutory discounts, you have an annual increase cap. That's a $200 discount. That means the, remember, we cannot increase your premium a year more than 18%. So you are receiving a $200 discount because we can't exceed the 18% to get you to your full risk premium. You are getting a pre-firm discount of $200, so your adjusted premium is $800. Your $800 premium will increase every year 18% until it equals your full risk premium. In some cases, it's going to happen in just a few years. In some cases, it may take quite a bit longer. 
But that is the way it's going to go. It's 18% a year based off your adjusted premium till you get to your full risk rate. And then you can see how the fees and surcharges, right? So we got 144, 25, 47. Now you can see how those fees and surcharges will make it look like the total pay amount will, is exceeding 18%. But this is the um, annual, the pay amount that you are not going to exceed the 18%. So you, now you're starting to see how confusing the fees and surcharges can be. Let's talk about uh, other discounts. So the pre-firm, newly mapped, and there's some A99 AR. Those are levy type programs are staying in effect, right? Uh, the policyholder would transition towards the true risk, so it doesn't matter if you're eligible for one of these statutory discounts or not, you are still progressing to your full risk rate. There are no more of the old grandfather types that allowed you to stay at a lower risk while everyone continue moving forward. You, everyone will increase. So one of the things I'd like to bring to your attention is a policyholder lapse. Under the old system, we were very lenient when someone had a a mistake and they forgot to pay their flood insurance. We, in fact, we have the date your policy expires, you have a 30-day grace period to get that money to us, right? That 30-day grace period, you, you submit a payment, that's fine, everything happens. You maintain all discounts, you maintain all statutory uh, discounts, you maintain your glide path. In fact, even some cases, if you exceeded 30 to 90 days, we can still work with you in the past. Under risk rating 2.0, we don't have that capability anymore. If you exceed that 30-day grace period, you are automatically a lapsed policy, and any discount or any glide path you had is gone. You have to come back in as new business, right? So remember, in new business, you come back in at full risk rate. Remember the $1,200, and then you had the 18 or the 800 adjusted. If they let that lapse, they will come back in at the $1,200 right off the bat. So it's imperative. If you have your in flood insurance and auto renewal that you actually follow through with your agents, you follow through who's actually submitting payments. We're getting a lot of inquiries now, especially uh, from people who have uh, been relying on others to make their payments. They have not, and their policies are lapsed, and they realize that trying to come back in full risk rate is uh, something they didn't plan for. We, we don't have the capability to allow any type of latitude anymore on risk rating 2.0. So the community rating... Uh, system. This is a volunteer program inside of a volunteer program, right? The NFIP is already volunteer. It's quid pro quo. We give you affordable flood insurance and in, re in return, your administration agrees to adopt and enforce floodplain regulations. In this particular case, the community has upped its ante. It is agreed to enforce higher standards. So that higher standards equals a CRS class seven for you guys. Every one of you, I don't know if you realize this or not, because of their hard work are receiving a 15% discount on your flood insurance premiums because of their participation in CRS. But that used to be limited. That used to be limited to only people who resided in the special flood hazard area. Under risk rating 2.0, that is not the case anymore. The, the CRS discount will be available to all 38,426 flood insurance policies in the jurisdictional boundaries of St. Tammany Parish. There are a couple stipulations, and I have some examples for you how this works. So this legacy right here it was the old system of how flood insurance is written. Then we have the new pricing methodology, which is risk rating 2.0. We have five different scenarios. We have one is inside of the special flood hazard area. It's a current A zone policy was built in compliance. And very important that it's built in compliance because it's inside of the special flood hazard area. And that shows that the community is enforcing the regulations. So under the old system, it was eligible for a full 30% discount. And under risk rating 2.0, it will remain eligible for the full 30% discount. Okay, so the, the CRS discount is notional here, of course, for your, your community, it was a class seven, so it's a 15% discount. So structure two is outside of the special flood hazard area, but if you look here, for some reason, it's a standard egg zone policy. And that means this homeowner, for some reason or the other, was not eligible for the cheapest preferred risk policy we had before. So the rules state that if you're not a PRP, you can get a maximum of 10%. Even though the community was awarded a 30% discount, the maximum they can get is a 10%. Well, under risk rating 2.0, this structure will be eligible for a full 30% once it hits full risk rate. Remember earlier in the presentation, I said it may be beneficial for some to jump to 
full risk rate immediately. This is an example of where that may, may happen. So the third structure is outside of the special flood hazard area. It is a preferred risk policy. Since it's outside of the regulatory special flood hazard area, floodplain regulations don't apply, so it's not applicable for compliance. But you'll see that there is no discount because preferred risk policies were already the lowest of the low products we had. So we, would, we did not allow discounts on top of that. So no discounts. However, since preferred risk prop, uh, uh, policies are going away, that law, that rule no longer pertains to us. So once this structure hits full risk uh, rate, it will be eligible for the full 30% discount. Structure four is inside a special flood hazard area, new business, built in compliance, no. Well, the first question should be, well, how did this get built not in compliance? I'm gonna have to have a talk to your floodplain administrator and we're gonna have to go inspect that and figure out why. But because it was not built in compliance, there is no discount allowed for that structure. So the fifth structure is the easiest to understand. It's outside of the special flood hazard area. New pricing methodology is new business, right? It's outside of the special flood hazard area, so built-in compliance is not applicable. As you can see, since it's new business, we don't even play with this. We jump straight to the full risk rate. 30% right off the get-go coming in as new business. So CRS is going to be really beneficial to a lot of, a lot of structures inside of St. Tammany Parish because you already have that rating. I, I'm very fortunate. This is one of the few communities I've been able to give this presentation on where they are already participating members in CRS. So if you have an 18% increase, it's already being offset by a 15% discount your community is offering. So think of that. It's great work. Machinery equipment. So machinery equipment is a 5% discount under risk rating 2.0, and I hate to say that it's not going to benefit. The answer is 0 0.05. Really? I didn't know I did that. The watch is smarter than I am. I'm sorry. Uh, so machinery equipment is a 5% discount. The thing is, it's all or none. Okay? So every requirement has to be met or no discount is applied. Now, that may be achievable if you have a building-only policy, right? So if you can put your HVAC system up in your attic or your water heater up in the attic, that may be achievable. But when you start adding in your content, right? So everyone here, easy way to understand your building from your content. If you were to put your house in the palm of your hand, turn it upside down and shake it, everything that falls out is your content. So your washer, your dryer, some aspects of your refrigerator, other components, right? now have to be on the proper floor because they are considered machinery equipment. Now, when we're talking slab on grade, the appropriate floor is the attic. So you're starting to see how it may be practical to have the water heater and HVAC up there, but not practical for the other appliances, right? But if you'll take a look at the other foundation types, very achievable to get this 5% discount. Now, the grand scheme of things, 5% is not a lot. Okay, but how risk rating 2.0 is beneficial is these discounts are compounded on top of each other. So remember the reduced premiums because of the construction methods and types? Now we have the, uh, the uh, ability to offer another 5% discount for machinery equipment, right? So very achievable for the other types of foundations. So when we add that on top of the next discount is flood venting. Now, flood venting is going to be between a 3 and 27% discount. The actual formula is going to be found in the flood insurance manual, and it goes off the square footage of the enclosed area. Okay, So that square footage is different for everyone. That's why the formula is in the firm. But as long as they are proper flood venting, and a lot of structures here are, 3 to 27% discount. So you start, you're starting to see how these discounts are adding up, right? Now, there was a question about dry flood proofing in there. Uh, we do offer flood proofing for non-residential, okay? Non-residential or commercial entities. I uh, have been asked a number of times, why don't we offer dry flood proofing discounts for residentials, residential properties? And the answer I have been told was this, right? So if, if a, a box store or car dealership puts in some type of architecture that allows dry flood proofing and those measures fail, they lose inventory. Right? If we allow dry flood proofing for a home and those measures fail, we lose lives. So we don't. Someone can still do it. They just know we're not going to get any type of flood insurance benefit for it. Okay. Let's talk about what's going away. We already talked about grandfathering. Um, 
I just want to be clear on this. That grand, the name of grandfathering is going away. But what is staying is that their starting point. So grandfathered policies are often a lot lower. So they're starting a lot lower starting point for their incremental increase or their glide path of 18%. It gives them more time to make decisions. Uh, the preferred risk policies are going away. The mortgage portfolio protection program is a way the lenders could put a forced place policy on people who did not buy a policy like they're supposed to. But lenders have gotten really good at this. And uh, there's only 100 of these in our book of business. So once again, to remove complexity, we did away with this. Now, the SRG guidelines used to be for unique structures. Say someone wanted to convert an old uh, fuselage for 737 into a fishing camp here in Louisiana, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's not out there someplace. Uh, we would have to go to them to find how to write their flood insurance. Well, the risk rating engine is very accurate, and we no longer need this, so we did away with that as well. Let's talk about what is not changing. Mandatory purchase of flood insurance is not changing. I know we're not using the firms anymore to write flood insurance, but we are still using the firms to determine mandatory purchase. Uh, once again, and I, I say these uh, several times throughout the presentation because uh, I really want some things to, to stick home. Everything that we have discussed on changes impact flood insurance. It does not change any compliance or regulations that the community has to enforce. All those have remained the same. The flood insurance rate maps that we've already talked about will still be used by the community for enforcement of their regulations. Letter of map changes, okay? We have an umbrella. It's called a letter of map change. Under that umbrella, we have a couple other things called letter of map amendments, letter of map revisions based on fill. They are ways in which individual homeowners can remove their structure from the special flood hazard area if they meet the eligibility requirement, right? Eligibility requirement for letter of map amendment is the lag. Remember that lowest part of the foundation, right? The lag is higher than the BFE. They can come out of the special flood hazard area. Under the old system, that was beneficial for two purposes. One, it did away with mandatory purchase of flood insurance, and two, it opened them up for um, eligibility for a preferred risk policy, right? But since we are now transitioning to an individual risk assessment, a letter of map change is really going to be able to do one benefit, and that is remove a structure from the special flood hazard area, which will remove mandatory purchase requirements. Now, that's kind of a, kind of a good thing, right? Because a mandatory purchase requirements, you're going to have to maintain the covers, coverage dictated by the lender. Amount of the home, value, evaluation of the home, amount of the loan, right? But if you don't have that criteria, the homeowner can purchase the amount of coverage they can afford. You know, maybe 250000 is unreasonable for them, but maybe 100000 is more. They can do that type of coverage. But the letter of map change won't have the impact on flood insurance as it once had. Once again, it's off the individual risks of the building itself. Statutory caps and annual rate increases. Remember, HAFIA is the reason we have that 18%. Increased cost of compliance is still up to $30,000. That has not changed. There is still statutory limitations on the amount of coverage for residential and commercial. Residential, it's 250,000 building, 100,000 content. For commercial, it's 500,000 building, 500,000 content. None of that has changed. Underwriting forms are uh, largely remained unchanged. A couple small changes just to reflect risk rating 2.0, but we didn't want to confuse any adjusters out there um, or underwriters out there with massive changes to those specific documents. An assignment of a policy to a new building owner. A lot of you may be aware of this as a rollover, right? So we have the, within the NFIP the capability to assign. This gentleman here has had his policies for 15 years. He started off as a preferred risk policy since he's rolled over to risk rate 2.0, but his rate is starting off at the last PRP rate which was average $500, okay? So he is selling his house, and he's marketing that he is willing to assign his existing flood insurance policy to the prospective buyer. So if he doesn't accept his rollover, he comes in full risk rate. Let's just say your full risk rate is $2,000. So wouldn't you rather take over his with a $500 starting point than incremental increase moving forward, or would you rather jump in and say, I want, I want to pay $2,000 right off the bat? So we still allow that. It's still something that happens. It has to be done at closing, but we still allow assignment of a policy to an existing or prospective buyer under risk rating 2.0. So April, I know it's already in the past. 
April of this year is when we implemented phase two. Phase one was started last October for new business. Anyone that wanted new business has to come in full risk rate. April of this year is when we started renewals. So when your renewal comes up this year, uh, or beginning of next, right, you will be renewed using risk rating 2.0 criteria. You can get information from your agents now on this if you want. They can give you quotes on this. They have a nice, their interface has a nice little button that they can click that says convert to risk rating 2.0. And if they tell you they can't, shop around for another agent because they can. So this is nationwide. We fully expect 23% of our policies to experience a decrease. That is about a million policies out of our 5 million. Now we do expect increases, but remember those are going to be largely the preferred risk policies that were never based off of risk. They were based because of the location on a map. So this is Louisiana specific. Um, there's about 495,900 policies in the entire state. So we fully expect 20% to receive a reduction and 70% to go from one to $10 per month. I know that's a little misleading, but that is a year increase until you hit your full risk rate. And I just got this information uh, yesterday. There has been 11,087 single family homes that have been rolled over into risk rating 2.0 in St. Tammany Parish. So on the grand scale, you have over 38,000 policies, so that is just a fraction, but we are starting to see the rollover of these policies. So this is for you all. Please take a picture of it. This right here, the risk rating 2.0 is the main website. Risk Rating 2.0 Equity in Action. Under that link, you're gonna find all these others. The ones I think are gonna be most beneficial for you are the Discount Explanation Guide and the Rate Explanation Guide. Under the old system, we had really good visual aids in which I could tell you, look, if you built one foot, this is how much you're gonna save. Two foot, this is how much you're gonna save. Three foot, this is how much you're gonna save. But under the old system, it was easier because we only had a few variables to go off of. Risk rating 2.0 comprises a lot more visual, a lot more variables, so it's a lot more difficult to determine visual aids to encompass a wide area because once again, we're going off of individual risks. Not every structure is the same. But these give a really good accounting for the rate and the discount explanations. I'll leave that up just for a second longer. So this is an example of what the rate explanation guide is going to look like for you. That is the link I just provided you. It's going to tell, it's going to go over a lot of what we just discussed today. What is covered, talk about replacement costs and coverage, building and content coverage, uh, replacement cost values, building and content deductibles. Uh, other links, I, I think the first set of links are going to be the most suited for you but there's a bulletin and there's a six page equity and action fact sheet that is still available online. So with that, I just wanna thank you very much. I have questions here uh, that we are ready to address. I think a large number of these questions have already been answered during the presentation, um, but I think we should go ahead and take the questions. All right. So what, the question one, what is the full risk rate? Now we identified now that the full risk rate is different for every uh, every person because they go off the individual risk of each structure. So your full risk rate will be identified on your declaration page when you see it once it rolled on over to risk rating 2.0. I wish, I wish we could put the full risk rates on quotes. But our, our, um, our agreements with the WIOs is all this pertinent information is found on the deck page. We didn't put any criteria or any requirements on what is required in the quote. So that will be on the declaration page. Question two, are rates based on the differences between top of bottom floor elevation and base flood elevation? Uh, so remember, we're not going off of BFEs anymore. We're not going off of um, um, you know, the bottom of the, the top floor, the, the top of the living floor to the ground. How do we get more rate reductions for elevating and dry flu, uh, flood proofing our pre firm buildings in the flood zones? NFIP 2.0 is providing very few rate discounts for these retrofitting buildings. Uh, because we're not providing a lot of discounts for those 
older preform structures because there's not a lot you can do to mitigate the true risk of flood. There are things you can do to help recover, such as use flood resistant materials, elevate electric components, not, not put in carpet anymore, but overall the structure itself can't be elevated. So those discounts won't apply. Now, if they are concerned or if they have flooded multiple times, uh, get with the uh, community in regards to possible grants that can be uh, administered either through FEMA or some state programs. Does risk rating 2.0 include any additional construction requirements that were not part of the previous system? Yes, so we did talk about the construction methods and types. Elevation have always, has always been important under under the legacy system. It will remain so under risk rating 2.0, but the type of elevations are gonna get a little bit more specific. Elevations and pure piles on post, you're gonna get a, a good discount, especially if you use masonry tie products. So this question I have to get back to, does risk rating 2.0 treat existing historic homes, uh, such as homes listed on the National Registry of Historic Places? So my understanding, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to answer this directly, but my understanding is that a lot of the regulations that apply to these apply to uh, uh, floodplain regulations such as compliance. So I can't see that not being impacted by its risk for flood insurance just because it's a historical structure. But I, I, will, I will follow up on that question with more detail for you. I can't find flood maps at FEMA or the NFIP websites anywhere online that show the, flu, the flood risk ratings under, uh, under the new risk rating 2.0. So you won't. Uh, the flood maps are out there. Those are the ones I use for compliance. Your licensed property and casualty insurance agents are the only one who have access, access to the risk rating engine. The engine is what is used to determine your risk, your premium. So in order to determine what your full risk rate is, contact your local agent and get a quote. How can a property owner obtain their target rate under risk rating 2.0? I'm not sure what they mean by target rate, uh, but my, I believe maybe the best rate. Well, risk rating 2.0 is designed to be filled out. The application is designed to be filled out with the homeowner and agent combined. Everything is self-reporting. So the flood venting, all that, all the discounts, machine equipment, all that is self-reporting. Documentations have to be submitted for underwriter review to verify self-reporting, right? But understanding your home is a big part of this. Understand if it is pure piles on posts. A lot of people uh, be surprised, don't even know their foundation types for their homes. I, had, I did a presentation yesterday and one lady said that she's not familiar with flood venting. Everyone else in the group, all realtors, looked at her like, how can you not be? That's one of the things we have around here. So homeowners are not familiar with their aspects. So uh, once again, know your home and take that to your agent. To verify that information FEMA uses correct, how do I get a copy of FEMA's 2.0 um, evaluation that lists? Uh, okay, so basically how do they, how do they get uh, access to the information comprising risk rating 2.0. So a lot of this information was made by government entities, so it's open to the Freedom of Information Acts. However, some of it is not. It's proprietary uh, data, proprietary programs that were created by third-party third party vendors that are not uh, susceptible to the uh, Freedom of Information Act. So uh, you want to get access to this, submit a Freedom of Information Act to FEMA headquarters, and they'll send you what they can. Do the vent openings on my lower garage door and wall have to be manufacturer certified as simply meet the... Okay, so flood ventings have to be engineered. Uh, have to be certified uh, one square inch per square foot. Your, your community's floodplain administrator is the person to ask about questions such as this uh, and maybe for recommendations. We can't advocate for people who put in vents or any type of event because it might show favoritism, but your local floodplain administrator may provide more insight on that. Why is this meeting being held after flood insurance rates were raised? Okay, so we have been, I have been nonstop on the road for two years. I have spoke at every venue I can get. I have spoke to groups as little as three people and as high as 600. I have been pushing the messaging out there. Um, we have, this is a little disconcerting, we've also put on insurance agent specific training for in property and casualty insurance in the state of Louisiana, state of Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. Anyone would like to hazard a guess of how many agents took advantage of this free training that offered continuing education credits? Two. That's darn near. 340. 
State of Texas with a population of 30 million, well over a million PNC agents, less than um, uh, 1,300. All my other states, less than 30. It's one of those situations, we can lead a horse to water, but we can't make him drink. This information has been out there. We have been pushing messaging hard. I was lucky that I'm here because I did a presentation in which uh, one member of the administration um, was there and, and thought maybe it would be a good presentation to have. So it's not, we're just now doing this. The information just didn't get to you for one, one reason or the other. Uh, there has been multiple requests to delay. In fact, it has been delayed um, well over a year uh, because of methods of headquarters. But when it did get that we were in a fast approaching phase one, there was a, a request for additional delays. But at that time, uh, headquarters felt that we were in a good position to initiate phase one last October and phase two this year. So we have. I'm, I'm sorry if you have not been able to hear any of our messaging, but we have been pushing the messaging really hard. If your house is raised above the minimum height, example, my, my, flood, my zone is 17 foot, but my house is 20 foot above sea level, why am I paying at all? Uh, mandatory purchase of flood insurance. Uh, you accepted federal dollars um, to um, uh, pay for your mortgage. It's a law. If you have federal dollars that touch your mortgage or a loan anyways, you're required to have flood insurance. Now, the elevation is going to be beneficial for you regardless. So once you get your mortgage paid off and mandatory purchase of flood insurance falls off, uh, it's up to you if you want to maintain flood insurance. I, I, I can't believe that you would live in Louisiana and not want to have flood insurance, but that's ultimately up to that homeowner. Uh, if a home is in flood zone X or C, can elevation certificate be used to reduce premiums? Like I said, if the elevation certificate shows our information is different and uh, it's, it provides a more advantageous rate, yes, it can be. But remember, elevation certificates are no longer required. I still encourage them. I hope my spiel about all the information that's on it really hit home because if, you if, if you're a homeowner and you don't have a newer one, and then the thing about, I'm going to take off my insurance hat here, put on my compliance hat here. The thing about elevation certificates, okay, our firms, okay, remember our flood insurance rate maps, they are a snapshot of time. They are a snapshot of time of the most accurate our engineers can produce at that time. But right when we give the community, here's your maps, as soon as he starts uh, building his first house, guess what? It changes the accuracy of that data. So if you just have one or two house built or one or two sets of development, no big deal. But when you start having unprecedented growth, 10 years, that data is no longer accurate. We have to do maps, right? It's the same thing with the elevation certificate. If you have an elevation certificate in your home and you've had unprecedented growth in your area, the ground truth that was used for that AC may no longer be valid. Maybe time to get a new one. But that being said, if you've had absolutely no growth at all, your EC may be good for decades. So that's just something to keep in mind. I see Mandeville is listed in the community rating system as a participating community. I did not see. Okay, so um, I came here today with information specific towards uh, St. Tammany Parish. If you have questions, if your community that you live in inside of St. Tammany Parish but have their own municipality, uh, contact your local floodplain administrator to see if, you are, if they are a CRS community. Uh, if they are not, based off the information today, I'd really push them to join the CRS. What justification can there be in raising my flood insurance rate when I obviously overbuilt our fl flood zone X in abundance of caution? I do live in Louisiana um, by rising, raising the elevation of my home when it was being built. So you took initiative, and I'm really happy you did. Because uh, this may be a hard pill to swallow, but the flood insurance premiums in Louisiana have been artificially low for years. You are actually, there was an article written out of... Uh, the advocate, Baton Rouge. Louisiana leads the state in the number of claims, but you are in one of the states of the most affordable flood insurance policies in the nation. I think there's only, there's only like five or six above you. How can you be, how can this state have the most affordable flood insurance premiums, but also lead the country in claims? So we, we are addressing that, and not just in Louisiana. We're, we're addressing this in the entire country, but the preferred risk zones, those X zones, those area minimal floodings, those have been eating our lunches for years. And we are addressing them by applying a risk instead of just their location on a paper map. 
According to my new flood, current flood maps, my home has 18% chance of flooding in the next 30 years. Okay, I'm not going to comment on that because I'm not quite sure how they determine 18% chance of flooding. Our flood maps are based for a 1% annual event. That's what our modeling goes off of. That's where our engineers go off of, okay? So there may not have been flooding in forever. That simply means, um, or you may have had flooding but not hit in certain areas. That just means that area did not hit the 1% chance of flood, okay? It's based on modeling. It's not where water has been. It's where we expect water to be and the worst case scenario of a 1%. So I'm not quite sure. I'll, I'll leave him to answer the, uh, send us to the floodplain administrator. 17, will the 18% increase, which I have already seen in my premium renewal, be compounded on the new amount every year? The 18% increase will happen every year until you hit full risk rate. But remember, we are finally giving you what your full risk rate is. Under the old system, it was a perpetual increase that was going to last forever. Is there an end point? Yes. So I'm glad, I'm glad that question is there because I can't believe I forgot to mention it in the presentation. There is an end point. When you hit your full risk premium, your premium increases will stop unless there's a significant change to your rating variables, right? So let's just say this gentleman, this beautiful orange shirt, decides to add on a wing to your house. So that's going to drastically change the replacement cost value for his property, right? That significant increase of RCV is going to cause a variable change. Or the community does a massive uh, flood control project uh, around uh, this lady's house, and not just impacting her house, but the entire block. That's a significant change to the ground and surrounding elevations, right? But minus those substantial changes, once you hit full risk rate, your premium will not increase anymore. Now, there may be small changes to the administrative aspect of the fees and surcharges, but that is not the premium, okay? Let me get through these questions and I'll get back to you, sir. How do I find out what my total current flood insurance premium would be without regard to limitation? If you say, um, get a quote from your, well, I have to say this. I don't like saying this, but I have to say this. In order for you to get your declaration page with your full risk premium, you have to buy the product. I would love to tell you to get a quote. But remember I told you we don't have a requirement on what all these WIOs can put on their quotes? So the only way to determine your full risk premium is the declaration page, so you have to buy it to see it. Please don't help me after this presentation. <laughs> That's good. No. So I, I, in an ideal world, I would be able to tell you what your full risk premium is without you having to continue your flood insurance policy. Or, uh, the ones who will know are new business because that is, the, uh, that is what they're coming in as, right? New business, full risk rate right off the bat. For renewals, you already have an existing policy. You have to pay your premium, which hopefully you plan to do regardless, and then you would see it when you get your new deck page but you have to pay for that premium to get your new deck page to see what your full risk rate is. So, St. Tammany Parish has many flood prone areas. However, FEMA does not cover flood losses unless a certain number. Okay, this was why I described what the definition of a flood is. In FEMA's eyes, a flood is inundation of two or more acres or two or more houses, one of them which is the policy owner's home. The question had to deal with a lot of area before we identified a flood, which is true. Two acres is a lot of land, but the two properties is really easy to meet. My insurance agent advises me that existing flood insurance policies are transferable to home buyers. Does this mean that a buyer of my home would also retain the benefit of the 18% annual limit on premium increase? Yes. That is what we meant by an assignment of a policy earlier in the presentation. Uh, yes, but make sure you do it at close. Why is it only flood insurance premiums being used to make, to make FEMA whole when FEMA provides emergency relief to victims of wildfire, earthquakes, etc.? Uh, those are funded through an entirely different streams of funds. Uh, the National Flood Insurance Program, as I said earlier, is meant to be a self-sustaining program by in, in taking in 
uh, premiums. But what we have found is that we had the capability to borrow from the Treasury for catastrophic events. We have. In fact, we're $20.2 billion in debt. We'll never be able to pay it off because we don't get enough money from Congress to pay it, and we're not using premiums um, to pay the debt. We're using premiums to pay claims. We, we pay... Y'all get on your home to your, your representatives tell them to forgive our debt because we pay $400 million a year in interest. That's $400 million that we could divide and mitigate homes, mitigate um, uh, entire blocks of houses, but we pay interest instead. Since the calculation is based off specific property, how can a property owner obtain the basis and calculations of the target rate? Once again, this comes down to your agents. Your agents have had access to trainings very similar to what this presentation is. This presentation is actually six hours. So when you guys want it, just let me know. Six hour presentation, I whittle down to an hour, a little bit over an hour. So agents have had access to training such as this, maybe not quite as long. So once again, they, they have to take some responsibility and understand the product coming out to help best serve their customers, right, their clients. What is FEMA doing to communicate the plans implementation at the local level? I'm here. I am trying really hard. I have been nonstop for the past year and a half. Uh, we have been relying on local uh, media. We have been relying on local floodplain administrators, floodplain management associations. We've been speaking at, at conferences, and we have been trying to get agents really spun up on this. And I keep bringing up agents. Don't get me wrong. There's some agents, especially in, in Louisiana, Texas, who understand this, who got it, and are working really hard to provide the best rate for their clients. Because like that gentleman said there, there are some that are still legacy that are more beneficial. Let them stay legacy until they have to roll over, right? That's what he, that agent just told him. Good advice. And there's some agents who are not doing that method of work. So, thank you, sir. What other resources do we have to ensure we are receiving accurate and up-to-date information? Well, with the government, you can trust us, right? Remember, send in information. Trust but verify. Send in your elevation certificate. Send in your ground survey. Send in a, a professional appraisal, something to that extent. And then double-check us. That's just fine. I want you to. If my husband and I are in flood zone X where flood insurance is not required, why are our flood insurance premiums expected to increase? Because remember, zone X, right, is the area of minimal flooding was never based on risk. It was based on your location on a map. Now we have the capability and now we're required to go off of every individual risk assessment for every structure in our book of building. That's why we're not going to go off the zones anymore. It doesn't matter if you're in an X zone or if you're in A zone. We're going to go off the same assessment for every building. 2013, we qualified to have our home raised, and as we were in the repetitive and uh, repetitive and redundant as we flooded five times, part of FEMA agreement was we had to maintain our flood insurance, which we have. My question and concern is how much will our flood insurance be, or will it remain approximately the same? No, the the answer to that question, 27, I'm not quite sure who submitted this, is you have to contact your agent, okay? You have to find out from the people who administer your grant what level of coverage you have to maintain, okay? If you ha we don't, it doesn't describe what type of, it said, it said raise, so I'm assuming elevation, but how high, how much was the cost? How much coverage do they have to maintain? All those have to be answered between the people who provided the grant and their insurance agent. When buying a piece of property to build my home, how do I find out what the flood insurance will be with given base foot eleva <laughs> elevations? I'm sure that's what they meant. They said flood evacuations. How and how high base elevation I would be to get to the best flood insurance rate? So you haven't built yet. You have uh, your you have your whole canvas. Take everything that we just talked about today. Don't do slab on grade foundations. If you do, I'm going to track you down. Build it up, elevate it to pure piles on posts. Boom, discount right there. Make sure you use masonry. Protect that first floor. Discounts right there. You know, go after that first floor, it don't matter. Build it with straw, hay, you know, wood frame, veneer, whatever you want. Protect that first floor, elevate it. And then the machinery and equipment's gonna fall in. Don't enclose, right? It, leave it open. We know that if you elevate the home, that area behind the home is, uh, you know, you wanna convert it to your, your disco room at night, you know, in fishing camp. Don't close this. Leave it open. Let that unimpeded flow of water go through. And you'll be surprised how little your flood insurance premiums are going to be when you follow all those avenues. Mm -hmm. 
Why would flood insurance go up so high for an area where flood insurance isn't even required? And has the levees surrounding the neighborhood. Okay, so a lot of people, uh, levees are good, okay? But levees are not perfect. There is examples of levees overtopping. There's examples of levees not being maintained. There's examples of levees um, that are tied to other avenues, right? Because a levee is an earthen dam. But the levee system is what provides the protection. So if the pumping stations are not maintained, if the, 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 the drainage pipes are blocked with cars, you know, what city that happened into, right? It's not going to work, and you're going to have flooding. So a levee will provide protection, but it's not the end all. Okay, so let, me, so let me address, first off, Congress didn't enact changes for Escrating 2.0. We did that on our own because Congress did not enact any changes to legislation no, on insurance. They gave you no, to do we did this all on our own. We acted with our own scope of authority. All these changes are already within our charter to do. We didn't have to go, we briefed Congress, but we didn't have to get their permission on this. That's why we didn't change any statutory requirements because if we try to change them, then we would have need Congress's permission, okay? So, and there's, that brings up another point. Uh, the National Flood Act of 1968 requires that we have a, a financially sound program, okay? What is not mentioned is that we have a financially sound affordable program. We don't have the capability to take affordability in consideration determining variables. We have had put uh, several reports in the hands of legislatures to implement affordability, but until they change the 44 CFR and allows us to implement means testing or other avenues, we can't. So hopefully, you know, this is taken up. I know Congressman Graves has been, been a big advocate. Uh, Senator Cassidy has been a big advocate of to try to get these changes. But until it is passed, our hands are tied about affordability. Now, as for the levies, that is a local level. The Army Corps of Engineers has to work with communities. Now, if the community builds their own level, that's on the community. But if they don't tell the FEMA or they don't tell the Army Corps of Engineers these levies are built, we have no way of incorporating these into data sets. So there has to be cooperation with the communities and federal agencies for these to be in effect. Well, if the levies were built... Okay, so there's a lot, of, a lot of things that are involved in the process of, of uh, doing development inside of the special flood hazard area. First and foremost, hopefully a conditional letter of map provision was done and approved before the levees began development. So we, we, can, we can, I think this is a discussion best had, had offline. Let me finish these questions. Um, if a property has never flooded since... 1980, wouldn't that fact qualify as property for a decreased flood premium? No. That just means there hasn't been a 1% event in that area since 1980. Does FEMA assess the potential flooding impact of any new developments, whether residential or commercial? Are flooding risks narrow or downslope from proposed new development? That should be part of the development process. It's very difficult to build in areas that have special flood hazard area. There's requirements that, um, that the, the development has to meet in regards to notification for communities upstream, downstream, and hopefully the community is, is requiring additional drainage 
Um, for new developments, uh, if you just tie that into existing drainage, it's going to be overwhelmed with velocity and capacity. So all those aspects have to be taken in consideration, and all that is done at the local level. I say the local level is because FEMA does not have land use authority here. It's all locals. We, we are guests when we come here. You know, we come here, we advise, we're a partnership. But ultimately, the responsibility falls on the local administration. Uh, why do city and boundary lines between parish and cities determine your flood levels on the same body of water? Um, our new flood maps go off of entire watersheds. Uh, so I'm not sure what they're referring to on this unless it's an old map. Old maps, we used to do studies based on communities. But we found out the, we did a map on a community, then something in the parish impacted that community. And then we found you know, something in a different parish impacted that parish, so we started doing watershed-wide studies. So that means it's an older map and more actually it doesn't really depict the flood risk of that area. In cases where geographic coordinates, latitude launching are required to determine a flood premium, tiny differences in reported geo coordinates can yield vastly different premium quotes. Okay, so yeah. Uh, this is a case where our geolocation tool is not able to determine the location of a home. So we have avenues in the flood insurance manual on how to use latitude and longitude. So by, use, by opening the flood insurance manual that is dated October 1 and later, there is guidance on how to use latitude and longitude to determine the location for um, flood insurance quote. 34, a range of policy discounts is listed in the online NFIP Risk Rating 2.0 Technical Guide. How can a homeowner determine if, she, if he or she is receiving all the appropriate discounts? Self-reporting. Go through your home. Know your home backwards and forwards and discuss these with your agents. Once again, your agent has a good, if they don't have a good understanding, shop around to one that does. Understand the type of discounts that your home can achieve. Can drainage retention systems be included as a flood premium assessment factor? Uh, no, they are not part of risk rating 2.0 when we are compared to distance to flooding sources. We mean substantial flooding sources, rivers, lakes, uh, Great Lakes, uh, coastal, oceans. Is this change affecting the cost of homeowner's insurance, which has also greatly skyrocketed? I can't speak on homeowner's insurance. I have no idea um, about this. I, I, I deal directly with flood insurance through the NFIP. Is there a defined process for appeal or dispute? Uh, if, you are, uh, if you want to dispute the numbers, like I said, you can submit additional documentation and we will compare them. If your numbers are more advantageous, we will accept those. If not, we will continue with what we have. And I think that was it for paper questions. Is it okay if I take some from the audience? Sure. Yes, sir. I have a, a couple of questions, and they're kind of bouncing around. I'm trying to organize as best I can. Uh, with inflation going up, and you mentioned that there's a replacement cost factor now, is there a federal cap or a NFIP cap to how much inflation will affect the costing of that element? So the answer to that question is I have no, uh, we have not been getting any, any information on how inflation is going to impact risk rating 2.0. Right now our val uh, variables are set in the replacement cost value, so I don't know, the inflation thing just really jumped up the last couple of months, uh, so there has been no additional guidance as of yet. But take my card, you send me an email, and I'll be happy to look for you. that make sure they give the same level of detail on their declarations page that you did on your mock example here? Well, actually, that mock example was based off of a live declaration page I received. Uh, but because of personal identification information, I didn't want to transfer it over. So the format was one. But remember, every one of them have different interfaces, and they may have a differences on the declaration page, but they should look somewhat similar to what you saw. But they will need to list the same information. Yes, there may be, it may be worded differently, but yes, it has to because that is the bare minimum for their, their policy. And at this time, is there a grievance policy or a cap for those people on either fixed incomes or public assistance? No. I'm sorry. I, as I mentioned earlier, I wish we could take affordability in consideration uh, until something is passed at, at the congressional level. Uh, we, we do not take affordability in consideration. 
Now, with that being said, though, we have submitted several plans to Congress on how we could. We're ready. We just need Congress to give us approval to do that. Him and then you, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Okay. So you said one thing that it wasn't clear to me, which was, let's say I have a value of $100,000 and I insure it for $100,000, but it's 20 years old, okay? Now, am I insuring it for $100,000 or am I insuring it for the depreciated value of the structure 20 years ago? You, you mentioned that you're taking depreciation in the when you pay. Okay, so the depreciation was under the old system. Under risk rating 2.0, it's all in replacement cost value. Now, here's the thing to remember. When you file a claim, you are going to get paid for flood damage. So unless your entire house is completely underwater, chances are you're not going to get paid to replace the entire house. We're going to get send adjusters out there, and they're going to determine what damaged by flood, and then they'll cut you a check based on that. Yes. Yes. Now everything under replacement cost value. He had his hands up first, and then I'll come to you. Yes. For St. Tammany Parish, when did the new rates go into effect? New rates? New flood insurance premiums. Oh, the phase one went into effect April of this year. So how it's going to work, though, not everyone's automatically going to jump over to risk rating 2.0. As of April, when your renewal comes, then that's when you will transition. So it's going to be all the way up to 20, beginning of 2023. April 2023, when we finally transition every uh, policy in our book of business to risk rating 2.0. Yes, ma'am. What I'm trying to understand the, um, the distance from a flood. Um, source. Is flooding source. Flooding source. How, how does that work? Like, what is the flood source? Okay, so 1,000 yards. We are very specific on this. We are looking within 1,000 yards of a significant flooding source. So an um, example of this is uh, Orleans Parish. New Orleans, when you're sitting in a cafe and you're watching that ship swim by, that's distance to flooding source. Even though it's protected by a levee, that's within 1,000 yards. So we're talking a significant flooding source. So we're not saying if you look out the side of your backyard and you see that dry tributary, that's not a significant flooding source. We're talking about, you know, like the Mississippi. We're talking about the Gulf Coast, Lake Pontchartrain, major lakes. Those are the flooding sources that we're referring to. Distance to flooding source. Because remember, we're no, this is what I meant by artificially low flood insurance premiums before. Because under Zone X, we used to not take anything else in consideration. But in reality, you are next to a flooding source, so you are at a higher risk. So it doesn't matter on your flood zones anymore. You're going to go off your distance to flooding source. So if you're close to that lake, you said, river, then it's going to be counted as a flood peril. Well, I can't answer that question. Um, well, now, if you're an X, so if you're an X, mandatory purchase of flood insurance doesn't require, right, because it's non-regulatory. Now, here's the thing a lot of people don't understand or don't know is that lenders can force place a policy for you or require you to have a flood insurance policy even if you're outside of a, a special flood hazard area. We don't see a lot of this because there's a lot of competition amongst lenders, but we're starting to see so much flood damage happening to houses in X zones that we are starting to see small trends of lenders requiring flood insurance, even though they're outside in a zone X. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then I'll come to you. Yes, ma'am. If she just got her premium within the last month or so, yeah, that is full risk rate. That's what she's paying. So it's not going to be going up every year? Nope. Here. She's coming in full risk rate. Now, that is if it's a new business. You said it's a new house, so there wasn't anyone there beforehand, right? So it wasn't a rollover. So, yeah, new business. What regulation or policy prevents FEMA from operating under its scope of authority again and moving that target further and further? As the full risk rate in 10 years, when I might hit it, 
they've likely increased further. What prevents that? The fact that we haven't had a major change in 54 years shows that we may be going 54 years before we have another change. But this is a really major yeah. change. You're right. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. So what we're doing is we, are, we, are, we are, just didn't come up with risk rating 2.0. It was five years of science. Our actuaries and other scientists determined that this is the avenue. There is nothing set in stone that there may not be changes further down the road. But right now, the changes say that we have to follow congressional guidance. Now, if Congress passes something different, we'll have to follow what Congress passes. It's a law. But until they pass something different, we made changes to make us financially sound and, and make sure people are paying their fair share regardless of what zones they were in around the entire country. So, no, there is no, nothing in regulations that say uh, that we can't change it, but changes are happening right now. And uh, quite frankly, I wouldn't want to go through this every five years. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. When did the 18% increase start? Is that something that just started recently? Or no. That started about five years ago? End of 2014, 2015, Congress passed the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affiliability Act. It offset Bigger Waters. Everyone remembers Bigger Waters, right? When everyone went to full risk rate, but it did that overnight. Well, Hefaya did away with a lot of bigot waters, but Congress left in a couple of um, uh, caveats. One, every flood insurance premium since 2015 increased every year. But a lot of you didn't notice it because it was small increases. If you were a PRP, your policy increased 3%, 4%. Very minimal. I mean, when the policies are five, dollars $600, you know, and the premium itself, without the fees and surcharges, are only three, dollars $400, that 3 4% increase is not substantial. But when you start getting to policies that are six, seven thousand dollars high risk flood zones, the increases uh, started to inc started to get higher and higher. Last year, the increase for PRPs was fifteen percent, but that was implemented in two thousand and fourteen by Congress. But they said no less than five percent, but no more than eighteen percent. So we're still keeping that eighteen percent. But yeah, if you go back to your records and you look every year, there was an increase every year since two thousand and fifteen. Yes, sir. <laughs> But I, I guess what, what I'm into is that increase is going to keep on going up to the 18% max until you reach that full risk premium. Yes. Now, like I said, some people are going to achieve that threshold relatively quickly. That diagram, I guarantee you, within two, three years, they're going to be at their full risk premium. Others are going to take quite a bit, a long time. But as homeowners, Speak to your agent and see which route is more beneficial for you because you got a 15% uh, discount. Some houses and egg zones may not be eligible for this 15% discount until you hit your full risk rate. It may be more advantageous for you to tell your agent, hey, let's skip the guide path. Let's go straight to the full risk rate and boom, we get 15% off of the top from there on moving forward. And your rate won't increase anymore from year after year. So those are, those are conversations best had with your agents. One last question. <laughs> yes. Ask your agents to do add on. Okay. Well, send me an, uh, get my card, send me an email, because I never had anyone ask me if they can uh, add on claims to their quotes. So that's something I'll have to have headquarters look at. If it's a, you know, for a realtor or a person buying a home, and they know it's flooded once or twice or three times in the last 20 years, or they don't know, and they plug that in, if they can research it and get that true rate after this rate increase, because you get the 18% for five years, and then you have a flood loss, and you got 10 years of 18%. Mm -hmm. then it's yeah, that's a great question. I haven't been asked that before. So please grab my card, send me an email on that, and I'll respond with an answer. Hopefully I get it from your quarters. Okay. Uh, as we close this presentation out, I want to thank the uh, citizens that have attended this evening. Uh, as I looked out in the audience at the beginning, there were, it was a full house of uh, residents, uh, realtors, engineers, insurance, 
in every, every occupation, I'm sure, just because there is a great interest in this. Uh, please take the information down, website, risk rating 2.0, equity in action. That website will give you all the information. Uh, this program will be replayed uh, on our website, stbgov.org, and we're happy to have been able to provide this information to our citizens. And we want to thank Mr. Jordan for, uh, for being here to provide this information. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir? Yeah, we have development requirements, building requirements that take in consideration, and we're updating, we continue to update our codes and uh, development standards uh, to address uh, the, the new requirements. So yes, we're, we're, we're always working on that. I want to thank our staff for being here too. Uh, many of the staff are, deal with uh, building codes and, and permits and uh, determining uh, some of the standards that we're talking about this evening. So thank you again. One last message. Uh, it was brought up about levies earlier. We do have our monthly levy board meeting this evening in Slidell at the Municipal Auditorium for those who attend, like to attend the levy, our local St. Tammany Parish or St. Tammany Levy District uh, meeting, 6 o'clock tonight at the Municipal Auditorium in Slidell. Okay, if there are no other questions, thank you all for participating. Thank you.